Okay, so welcome everyone to today's One Word Mind seminar. So today it's my great pleasure to have Professor Mihai Kukuringu to speak in our seminar. So Professor Kukuringu is a currently an associate professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Oxford and a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute in London. And Mihai's research focuses on development and, and the mathematical statistical analysis of algorithm for data science, network analysis, certain computational hard inverse problems on large graphs with applications to various problems in machine learning, statistics, finance, and engineering. So today he will talk about spectrum methods for clustering sign and direct network. So now the stage is yours, yeah, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the, for the invitation. As, uh, <clears throat> as Xuan had mentioned, I'm gonna be talking today about uh, clustering problems on uh, a couple of families of graphs that I think have been relatively less explored in the literature in the recent years. And then uh, time permitting in the end, I'll draw some connections to the problem of synchronization and ranking from pairwise comparisons. And all of this is joint work with, uh, with my colleagues, Simon Tiagi, Hesun, and some of our uh, current and uh, previous PhD students and interns, including some at uh, Oxford and the Turing and then Lille, and also including Deborah Sulem, who's gonna be on the job market in the, in the fall. So just to set the stage, uh, let me say a bit about uh, 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 clustering on graphs in general. So the typical set we encounter is that of an undirected graph G on n vertices, where each edge has associated a positive weight Wij encoding uh, similarity between the vertices and this is sometimes constructed via a, a, a kernel. For example, if X sub i are images or audio strings, uh, this Wij encodes the similarity between the endpoints. And the goal in this problem is to partition the clusters into to find a typically disjoint partition uh, of the vertex set such that the intercluster edges have much higher weight and then the intercluster edges have much lower weight. So this is a, a picture here on the left of a scrambled graph and how it would look if we unscramble it. And then uh, on the right hand side, those are adjacency matrices at different uh, varying degrees of, uh, of, of noise. So uh, the bigger the discrepancy we expect between the, uh, the block diagonals and the off, off the block, block diagonals, the easier the problem uh, be, be, uh, becomes. Okay, so one uh, comment I'd like to make uh, uh, that relates to the topics we're dis discussing today is that unlike the standard graph clustering setting that does require a discrepancy between the edge density within cluster and across clusters, uh, so this seems to be different in order uh, for us to be able to recover the clusters. In our settings today, this is implicitly achieved by either the sign of the edges or the directionality of the edges, as we'll see in these two examples on side and vector clustering. And uh, in the case of synchronization and ranking, this cluster is, uh, is implicitly achieved by the different signals that sit at the nodes of the graph. Okay, so one fundamental concept that we're gonna be needing is that of a, of a graph cut. So typically, if you, give a, if you have a graph G and you're considering two subgraphs A and B, then the cut between A and B is just given by the sum of the weights of the set of edges that connect the two groups and the cut uh, between uh, A is just implicitly assumed to be the cut between A and its complement. So this is a, a fundamental concept in graph clustering. And the goal typically is we want to find the partition of G into A and B in order to minimize the resulting graph cut, okay? Now for the last two decades, spectral clustering has been one of the, if not the go-to method for clustering graphs. So the idea for spectral clustering is that we want to find a, a low dimension embedding of the node set into RK and performs k-means clustering. And typically this embedding is obtained by considering the extremal eigenvectors of a suitable graph matrix, typically like a graph Laplacian. So in the normalized cut example that Shin Malik introduced over two decades ago, uh, we want to minimize uh, the summation of uh, normalized cuts. So we're minimizing over cluster assignments, K is the number of clusters. And for each cluster C, uh, we want to minimize the ratio between the cut of CI, so the cut between CI and the complement, so all the edges leaving the, the, the cut, and the volume of this cluster, where the volume is, def is defined as the sum of the total degrees. And then the normalization here by volume is just to prevent uh, trivial solutions where you have clusters of very small size. So we're gonna be, uh, this problem will be recurring later on of how do you also do this normalization to promote this trivial solution. So unfortunately, this normalized cut is a discrete optimization problem. It can't be hard in the worst case. So what people typically do is they relax the discreteness constraints and the solution uh, is given uh, by the smallest eigenvector vector of this normalized graph Laplacian matrix here where D is a diagonal matrix where you put the degrees on the diagonal and L is a usual combinatorial graph Laplacian of, of G. Uh, right, so uh, L is D minus A is, is a PSD matrix. It captures the cut if X is a cluster indicator vector. And this quadratic form that we'll also be using in a couple of contexts today, X transpose LX, it typically counts 
the number of edges living in the cut, right? So think of the X sub i as a cluster indicator vector. Okay, so this has been the, 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 the standard setup in the uh, unsigned, undirected setting, okay? Now comes uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the question that some, one of the questions we're considering. So the motivation uh, is that many applications will involve graphs where the edge weights have both negative and positive values. So think of the negative values as encoding a proxy for the dissimilarity. So there are many applications for this problem in social networks where the negative edges encode enemies, image segmentation where you want to encode similarity or dissimilarity information of pixels uh, on time series clustering. So, so that's kind of the, the way I arrived at this problem is that, is that I was interested in clustering time series data in particular financial time series. Uh, and the natural thing to do there is to consider the correlation matrix. And lo and behold, you have a matrix. You can think of the, the correlation matrix potentially after thresholding on the p-values. For example, you have a sparse uh, signed network that we'd like to cluster, okay? So uh, the goal here would be we want to maximize the sum of the weights of the positive edges uh, within the cluster because positive edges, they belong in the cluster. That's where they, they, they should be naturally. And we want to also maximize the sum of the weights of the uh, negative intercluster edges because negative edges, uh, they should lie across clusters because that's where they belong. They should be uh, you know, spanning different clusters. They encode dissimilarity information. Okay, so one simple toy problem of this model, when you have only k equals to two cluster, it's also an instance of the so-called uh, group synchronization problem where the underlying group is C2, and I'll touch a bit more bit, uh, about uh, this at, at, at the end. So in the case of two clusters, think that you just have uh, node labels, plus minus one, these are the C2 group elements, and the edges encode uh, pairwise ratios of the endpoints. So in the case of Z2 where an element is, is, is its own inverse, in the noiseless setting, an edge IJ just like I have here on the, on the left-hand side, uh, an edge IJ just captures the product of the endpoints, right? So the problem is given information on the edge labels, can we recover the uh, labels of the node points? And of course we can do this up to a global sign. Now the problem is made harder by the fact that uh, an adversary comes and they flip some of the edges, they add noise to the problem and noise here uh, in the case of synchronization over Z2 is just flipping some of the, some of the edge weights. Right? And, and, and the problem is, can we estimate the group solution, uh, you know, the, the plus minus one sitting at the node of, of, of a node such that we make, we satisfy as many given edges as possible. So think of them in terms of maximizing happiness in the system, uh, right? And this has been looked at before. Uh, and one natural thing you can do, you can, you know, in thinking in terms of this intra-cluster happiness, you can maximize this following quadratic form here. So this is the plus one whenever uh, the, uh, the uh, solution uh, of the endpoints matches the, the, the the measurement on, on the edge. And this, you can write it in, in a simple form as a maximization of a quadratic form X transpose AX, uh, which unfortunately, this is an NPR problem. If we insist that the, that the elements are plus minus one, we do relaxation constraint by relaxing that the sum of the absolute, uh, squared absolute values equals to, to, to N. And this problem, we know how to solve. It's just maximization of a quadratic form subject to to constraint. And then this maximum is achieved by the normalized top eigenvector vector of this matrix A. Okay, so this uh, this is a simple example of synchronization over 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 Z two or sign clustering with K equal to two. And maybe one other thing I'll mention here, uh, and it's a good opportunity to introduce this idea of a sign Laplacian will be recurring, is that instead of maximizing intercluster happiness, we can also formulate the synchronization problem as a least square problem by minimizing the following quadratic form or minimize unhappy edges. So X i minus uh, A i j X j squared. This is just uh, uh, this will be non-zero whenever we have an unhappy an unhappy edge. And then if you do a little bit of an algebra here and you open up parentheses and group up terms and so on, you arrive at a minimization of a quadratic form, of the similar one that we've seen before, except that the matrix here is the so-called sine graph Laplacian. So this d bar minus a. So a is the adjacency matrix that we're the measurement matrix that we're given. And D bar is just a diagonal matrix where on the, di on the diagonal, we have the row sum of the actual values of the matrix A, right? So, uh, so this will be, and it has been proposed before, uh, the sign Laplacian as a way to extract clusters as I will uh, comment in a, in a little bit. So, um, so in particular, Kunedis et al, about 10 years ago, they proposed uh, assigned versions of this two-way ratio cut problem by considering uh, different types of signed Laplacians. So this is uh, the combinatorial sign Laplacian, which is D bar minus A, where I, as I said uh, before, this D bar, the diagonal matrix where you sum up all the, um, uh, the, the, the degrees. Uh, this L bar is also a PSD matrix, and there are also different normalizations of it. So just like in the unsigned case, we have different flavors of Laplacians, combinatorial, 
random walk and, and, and symmetrized. In the sign case, you also have analog versions for the this uh, sign Laplacian and random walk and, and symmetrized. And this latter one is particularly suitable for security good distribution. And the idea here is that the top eigenvalues and eigenvectors of these different flavors of sign Laplacians, they contain some structural information about the topological structure of the network, and then we can leverage these extremal eigenvectors for, for clustering. And one comment here is that Knyazev argued a few years ago uh, that the standard graph Laplacian is preferable for spectral clustering of sign graphs compared to L bar. But uh, I should say that we found no evidence of this. It works quite well in practice. And we're also were able to give some theoretical guarantees that this uh, random mock Laplacian actually does recover the underlying uh, graph structure. And the last uh, reference I'll make is this uh, uh, work on balanced uh, normalized cut uh, by the Indrajit Dillon's group at Texas Austin a few years ago, where if we think of this uh, X sub i vectors as being uh, indicator cluster vectors for each of the node clusters. And then we, if we decompose the adjacency matrix into the positive subgraph and the negative subgraph, then uh, if we consider uh, this, uh, what is quantity d plus minus a is doing, this it turns out that this, uh, so d plus is the diagonal matrix where you put the degrees on the diagonal of the positive sub matrix, right? So, so d plus is associated with uh, the degree matrix corresponding to a plus. Then this, is, this you can write it as L plus plus A minus. And, uh, and actually, if we ask what does a quadratic form in this matrix would count, well, X transpose L plus X actually counts the total weight of positive edges across the clusters, right? Because we've seen before that this quadratic form in the Laplacian is uh, counts cut across clusters. And then X transpose A minus X discounts the total weight of negative edges within the clusters. And what they propose in their paper is that uh, to minimize this balanced ratio cut, so they want to minimize this uh, cut here and then normalize, uh, just like we've seen in the Shimalik uh, standard normalized, uh, normalized cut version, they divide by the size of the cluster just to promote staying away from trivial, from solutions that have trivially small clusters, okay? So uh, before I discuss a bit about of our, of our approach to this, to this problem, I should say that some of the inspiration for this problem came from uh, an AI test paper we had some years ago on constraint clustering. So constraint clustering is a, is a quite popular problem in machine learning where you're given a data similarity graph matrix S and for some reason you have some domain knowledge specified as a form of uh, soft constraints uh, in the form that uh, must link and cannot link constraints. So somebody is giving you some side information that some pairs of nodes should end up in the same cluster and these are the must link constraints or should not end up in the same clusters and these, these are the cannot link constraints. So what we did, we, we uh, back then we proposed a generalized eigen problem for this constraint clustering problem where the usual graph matrix is given by a combination of the similarity matrix plus the must link constraints with some type of parameter and then the cannot link constraints were encoded in this graph f that as you'll see this in today's talk this would play the role of this um, uh, cannot link constraints or the negative similarities and we propose a generalized eigen problem for this problem for, for this constraint clustering problem uh, and also discussed uh, um, how we can use it for image segmentation and, and also provided the uh, um, uh, generalized trigger inequality cut, uh, providing a lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue of generalized eigen problem. So back to the sign clustering problem that I was discussing initially. So recall that uh, given a graph H, the cut between C and the complement is the sum of the edge weights leaving the cut. No, okay. So now remember that in, in, in sign clustering, we would like to, uh, have an objective function where all the positive edges end up uh, inside the clusters because that's where they belong. And then the negative uh, edges, they should end up in the cluster, uh, across the cluster because uh, that's where they belong. Or in a, if we want to minimize things, we want to minimize uh, the complement this quantity we wanted to uh, to minimize because that's so uh, you know positive edges should not lie uh, in in the cut potentially divided by the volume of uh, of the of that cluster in 2g plus and then similarly if we look at the negative subgraph the same quantity here we want this to to maximize because negative edges they should lie in the cut so in other words if we take the inverse of this then this becomes the quantity in in, in 11 that we also want to uh, minimize okay so ideally, we want to find the clustering such that both 10 and 11 are, are small. So what we're doing, we merge this objective in 10 and 11, uh, but have with, uh, with the trade-off parameter. So we take the numerator of these two problems and combine them with some trade-off parameter tau plus, uh, uh, tau, tau minus. We do the same thing for the numerator, which this may seem a bit ad hoc at first, but this uh, turns out to be theoretically justified. So think of this tau plus and tau minus to denote trade-off or regularization parameters. 
So a little bit like analogous to the uh, normalization in the standard uh, schematic uh, uh, normalized cut problem. And this also has a natural extension to more than two disjoint clusters. So you're minimizing over K cluster assignments, you're summing up over all these normalized cuts uh, where you have the cut shifted by, uh, by, by, by this volume. And um, if you're a bit careful with how you define the normalized indicator vectors of where a node belongs to a cluster or, or, or no, then you, you, you can write this uh, uh, objective function in short form as a in, in, um, in terms of quadratic forms on this, uh, on this, uh, uh, on, on this graph. So in the numerator, uh, this cut here, the shifted regular cut is just um, uh, a quadratic form uh, in the positive Laplacian shifted uh, by this uh, D minus, so the, the diagonal uh, degree matrix. And then you have something similar uh, in the denominator where again here L plus and L minus are the Laplacians of the positive respective and negative subgraphs and then uh, same thing for D plus and D minus. Um, now, if we drop the discreteness constraint and allow each of the cluster indicator vectors to, to live in Rn, and uh, when we do some change in of notation, so we define these new vectors uh, z1 to, uh, to uh, zn that to be orthogonal with respect to this uh, shifted negative Laplacian, then we, we, we arrive at the, at the modified version of the previous objective function. And um, with, with a bit of extra work, we can, uh, and, and, uh, and making uh, assumptions on the full rank of this uh, shifted negative Laplacian, and by doing some appropriate uh, change of variable uh, here in equation 17, then we can essentially recast our objective problem 16 as uh, that of a minimization of a quadratic form, which doesn't look too nice, but it's this one here in, in equation 18. So uh, we're trying to minimize over uh, all matrices y such that y transpose y is identity of try, uh, try to minimize a trace of this y transpose times this very uh, ugly matrix here that we call t times uh, y. And this, for this type of problem, we know how to get the solutions of this problem. They're just given by the smallest Kagan vectors of this, uh, of this matrix here, T. Okay, so uh, just exploring the interplay between the uh, spectrum of this uh, matrix pencils and, uh, and, and, and the usual uh, um, uh, eigenvalue eigenvector pairs, the, the algorithm essentially uh, boils down to something very simple. We take the graph G, we decompose it into the negative and positive subgraph, we find the smallest k generalized eigenvectors of this matrix pencil here, this shifted Laplacians where tau plus and tau minus are suitably chosen regulation parameters. And then we cluster the resulting embedding vertices in, in Rk using k means plus plus. And we can do something similar where, with, where instead of using the usual combinatorial Laplacian, you know, the usual d minus a for, uh, for L, we use the symmetrized versions of them. So that's where when you, uh, for example, for L plus, the symmetrized version is just, you take the usual L plus Laplacian, uh, and then you hit it left and right with the uh, d plus to the power minus one half. And then this, in our experiments, you used uh, something that's called log PCG, which is a precondition eigen solvers for solving large scale PSD problems, because in, in, both of, of our matrix here are, 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 are Laplacian. So the, 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 in, the, in the experiments, you could also run quite large, uh, this scalable to quite large problems as well. Um, so now one may ask what's a potential uh, stochastic block model for, for which some sort of guarantees could be provided. So, you know, for those of you who've seen stochastic block models before, this may not come as a surprise. So in the general setting, we have uh, K, let's say equal size clusters for now. And then for each edge in the same uh, cluster, we assign a plus one. If they're in different clusters, we assign a minus one. And then we flip, uh, just, just to model the noise, we flip the each edge with probability eta less than one half. So if I and J lie in the same cluster, uh, the, the matrix given by the following mixture, with some probability one minus p, the edge is completely missing. With probability p, the edge is, is, is present. And for the present edges, with probability eta, it is noisy. So when, whenever i and j truly line the same cluster, noise means minus one. And with the remaining probability, this is a plus one. And then you can do something uh, the same when i and j lie in different clusters, right? So here, again, with probability one minus p, the edge is missing. And, uh, and, and you can model the case where the noisy edge or the incorrect edge. And uh, what you could do here is give performance guarantee for this uh, sponge algorithm in the case of k equal to two and later expanded it to, uh, to higher values of k against these two parameters sampling sparsity and noise level eta. So some of this, uh, how do some of this uh, SSPM instances look like? So as you would expect on the block diagonal, you just have pl plus ones and uh, minus ones outside of the block diagonal. And then once you start adding noise, then uh, the you know the signal gets uh, you know dimmer and dimmer, and the problem is is harder to to the clustering is harder to recover, right? 
So what sort of robustness guarantees uh, one could give for this setting? So recall that we had this uh, quite long uh, matrix T here for diagram vectors we were computing as a, as a solution to our uh, minimization problem. And if we denote by T bar sort of the expected counterpart of T where we replace each of the matrices there with the expectation. And uh, for simplicity, let's consider the case of K equal to two. Let's assume that the planted clusters are C1 is the first n half of the nodes and C2 is the second half of the nodes. And then this W vector is just a plus one for the first half of the entries and minus one for the second half. Uh, and then these two matrices V2T and V2T bar are, are, are these two tall matrices that consist of the smallest eigenvectors of these two, uh, two matrices. And um, uh, what you could show that the range space of these two matrices T and T bar is close to each other provided N and P are large enough. So for example, for, uh, for, for you know, when, when eta lies into zero and one half, and you have some appropriate conditions between tau plus and tau minus your regulation parameters, uh, then it turns out that W and the all ones vector are the smallest Weigen vectors of this uh, T bar matrix, kind of our uh, expected T. Uh, and then uh, by establishing concentration bounds on uh, this L plus, L minus Laplacians and D plus and D minus, this lead to uh, bounding uh, the, the, the spectral norm between T and, and T bar. And this in turn uh, will lead us to uh, get a bound on the eigenspace alignment of these two matrices via the davis kahan theorem. Um, okay, and um, um, the downside of this of this approach is that um, the, the sparsing, uh, the, 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 this p parameter that governs the edge density, it needs to be at least on the order log n over n in order for some of this concentration bound to hold. And I'll discuss a little bit um, uh, la later um, uh, what sort of regularization technique we, we can do in the very sparse regime. So when p is below the log n over n. Um, so now let's also see how this works in, in practice. Um, um, so we, we, we compare here a number of um, a number of algorithms. So sponge and sponge sim is the algorithm that I just described. And then A is just computing the uh, using the spectrum of the given uh, signed uh, adjacency matrix. And L bar and L bar sim are this uh, signed Laplacian and the symmetrized version. And this uh, B and C and BRC are this uh, uh, balanced normalized cut. Uh, by Dylan at all. So if we look at a, at a problem where you have K clusters and, and a very small edge density, um, and let's look at, let's say we vary the noise, the flip probability eta here, and on the y-axis we have the recovery score. So we measure recovery score by the adjusted RAND index, so the higher the better, we'd like to be closer to one, so the closer to one we are, the more we recover the clusters. So in this regime here, most methods, uh, you know, seem to perform fairly, uh, fairly similarly. If we increase the number of clusters, then we already can see that uh, this our proposed method sponge already does quite a bit better than everybody else, especially that it can tolerate higher levels of noise. Okay, and then um, what, what's interesting here is that the gap in performance between uh, sponge and the rest of the method is even wider when we make the problem harder. So in the large K setting, so here's K, we have 50 clusters, our noise level is 10%, so we flip 10% of the, of the edge weights. Uh, and then as we vary the edge probability P, so the sparsity of the graph, then most of the other methods, uh, they really struggle when, for very, very sparse graph while uh, our proposed technique still does quite well. And similar here with, with only 20 clusters and the very, very sparse regime, so less than 1% of the edges in the graph present, uh, many of the methods cannot really recover, uh, uh, you know, for a large enough noise level, many of the methods die out while the sponge is still performing well. Um, so maybe to briefly mention one uh, real world application. So we've also looked at that I mentioned at the beginning uh, in the context of uh, clustering time series data. So let's say if we, uh, if we take 1500 uh, time series coming from say daily stock returns, and then we look at the, uh, the correlation matrix and we try to cluster it using uh, the, the sign Laplacian, then we get, uh, let's say we, we, we're looking for 10 clusters uh, that are encoded in the rows of this, in the columns of this uh, figure here. And this, this uh, sectors here, the, the rows, are sectors in the financial industry. And indeed we observe some alignment, right? So the columns here are our clusters and the rows are uh, this uh, sector, uh, in, you know, sector industry. Um, but the main thing I think I should say here that if we look at some of these competing methods like BNC, they really struggle to find solutions when the, large, when the number of clusters is, is large. So here the top row, uh, I'm looking for 10 clusters and the bottom row I'm looking for 30 clusters. And those are you know, different flavors of, of algorithms. So our sponge uh, and sponge symmetric compared to this balanced normalized cut and this uh, science symmetric Lapl uh, Laplacian. So when we, we're looking for a large number of clusters, some of these existing methods uh, struggle. 
Um, and I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the uh, sort of um, uh, conditions that we uh, we required for the theoretical guarantees was that the sampling sparsity was above uh, log n over n. Um, so what we've done in some follow work, we'll also look at regularization in this very sparse regime. So um, it, it, it's well known that spectral methods, they tend to underperform in this very sparse regime where the sampling edge density is on the order of one over one over n. Uh, and there are many ways that people have, uh, have regularized such networks. So the problem in the very sparse regime is that uh, you don't get concentration, uh, the same type of concentration results that you get when P is on the order log n over n. And there are many different ways that people, uh, so this problem arises because you have some very uh, large spurious degree nodes in the network. And, and people have different ways of taming this uh, high node degree. So they either add different regularization to the edges that connect to the high degree nodes, um, uh, the one that we used here was building on work by Joseph and Binu in a 2016 paper, and they uh, provided a theoretical justification for the regularization where you shift your adjacency matrix by the all ones vector. So you add a bit of a mass on all the edges in your, in your graph, and then they can uh, prove uh, concentration results uh, in the usual setting of unsigned unbracted graphs. So we did something similar here where uh, our, what we call our signed regularization step amounts to adding uh, a weight to each edge, including self loops to both the positive and negative subgraphs. So if we choose some regularization parameter tau plus and tau minus, so we have our usual decomposition of the adjacency matrix into the positive and the negative submatrices. Uh, and then we add a bit of a mass. So this is an all ones matrix. So we, we add a bit of a mass to the positive uh, submatrix and then we do something similar Add a bit of a mass to the negative sum matrix, and then we proceed by using the usual normalized graph, uh, graph Laplacians corresponding to the regularized matrices. And then we do something uh, similar for this uh, symmetric sign Laplacian, and then uh, proceed uh, as in the usual case by looking at the extremal eigenvectors of this matrix uh, for the, to, re to recover clustering along with the, with the guarantees. And then we, we can see here that in, in both examples, when we regularized both the sign Laplacian and both our sponge matrix, so this uh, that we've discussed earlier, uh, so this is a heat map showing the adjusted RAND index of so the recovery score as a function of the regularization parameter tau plus and tau minus. So indeed, as you can see here, there's some uh, regimes for which indeed this regularization does help us to recover better clusters. And uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll end this part about clustering with some uh, potential future work uh, we've been thinking about. So this is inspired by some work in Aristides Jonas's group where they look at polarization in signed graphs. So um, what polarization means is that you're looking in your network, you're looking at a, at a, at a, at a subgraph such that uh, that subgraphs can be very well represented as an SSBM model with k equal to two. So in other words, we're looking for uh, two, two communities, the red and the blue, such that most of the edges between them, though, so this red edges, the, the red dotted edges are negative edges because that's, that's where they encode the you know, enemy information. And then the blue edges within the communities are, are, are positive. So the idea is that you're given a big graph and you're trying to find these planted communities. And they also consider the setting where you're given some seed node information. So you're given some seed nodes A and B uh, and you want to find the clustering uh, around this nodes A and B. So in terms of our model that we could potentially look in, in, in future work is that, so these are how the standard matrices uh, would look like, uh, let's say in the complete graph setting for varying levels of noise. This is a standard SSBM where we have plus ones on the diagonal blocks and minus ones on the outside. But in this polarized model, you just have a chain of these two communities like this SSBM uh, chained up on the, in, a, in, in, in a graph. So the difference being that outside of the communities, you don't have the any negative information, but you only have uh, random edges. And potentially it might be interesting to look at them in a planted setting where most of the nodes in the cluster, uh, most of the nodes in your graph do not belong to any of the two communities. Okay. Um, so now let me switch gears a little bit and, and, and talk about uh, directed graph clustering. And, and, uh, um, and it will be another example of a problem where clusters arrive not because of discrepancies in edge density, but just because uh, of the directionality in the edges. Okay, so the motivation here comes from uh, money flowing in a transaction network, some applications we're looking at Turing a couple of years ago. So imagine here in a nutshell that you have participants in a network wiring money to each other and, uh, and the green nodes denote, uh, um, if you just look at the green nodes, let, let's say that we, they encode some sort of criminal or, or organization along which people uh, send money. And then the black edges, uh, they are, uh, you know, noise in the network. Uh, 
So the idea being that we like to find clusters of nodes, like in this example here, cluster one, two, three, four, and cluster five and six, such that there's a very high imbalance in the flow of the edges. So most of the edges flow from the left cluster to the right cluster, and very few of the edges flow the other way. Now, in general, when you're looking at directed graph, there are a number of challenges that arise. So usually the, the, the usual normalized cut value that we've seen in the, one of the earlier slides or very similar clustering metrics based on edge density, they typically fail to uncover any of the underlying patterns. And um, some of the asymmetric relationships in the network, they really contain some sort of essential structure about the graph that is lost if you do some naive symmetrization. So um, I just want to use one example here to, 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 to drive the point home. So let's look at a, a data set where uh, that encodes migration patterns in the US. So this is people migrating from one county to another in the US within 3,000 counties. And um, let's see what happens if we just do a naive symmetrization of the JSON symmetrics, we get the clustering that looks like the one here. So perhaps not surprising, these clusters align fairly well with the political boundaries. Uh, which kind of makes sense because there's a lot of intrastate migration as opposed to interstate migration. However, the type of clustering that we propose to, to do, which we call Hermitian clustering that I will elaborate on in a little bit, finds a different types of clustering, like the one I'm showing here. <clears throat> but the idea of this clustering is that we're not driven by edge density, but we want to find clusters such that, so say we find K clusters, such that when we look at the all K choose two pairwise interactions between clusters, or at least a subset of them, we observe a high imbalance in the, in the, in the flow of uh, edges. So for, for example, if we take from our clustering here, only the, the, the red and the green clusters, and we ignore everything else, so everything else here is encoded in the yellow clusters, then we, uh, we observe a very high imbalance in the flow of edges from the red clusters to the green clusters, okay? And, uh, and the algorithm that we propose is extremely, it's embarrassingly simple. And, and because of th this is also, you know, easier to, to, to analyze and get some theoretical guarantees. So what is the algorithm? So we're given a, an a, um, adjacent symmetric of directed graph M. If that uh, ma matrix is not skew symmetric, we make it skew symmetric by looking at M minus N transpose. And then we build this Hermitian matrix, which is just M minus M transpose times the uh, IOTA, the imaginary number. So this is the Hermitian matrix, it has real eigenvalues. And then what we could show is that whenever the direction uh, of the edges impart a certain cluster structure in our graph, then this structure is roughly encoded in the eigenvectors associated to the top eigenvalue uh, uh, eigenvectors of this matrix A. In other words, we're able to capture uh, clustering that are driven by these large pairwise imbalances. Okay, so what could be a potential directed, uh, a potential extension of a stochastic block model uh, to the directed setting? So let's say we have K clusters, C1 to CK, they, they are our cluster communities, uh, potentially of different sizes. And uh, let's say that P is the probability of an edge existing between two vertices within the same cluster, and Q is the probability of an edge between two vertices belonging to two different clusters. But for the purposes uh, here, for, for, for just exclusion purposes, let's think of P and Q to be equal, just so that there's no room to cheat because we don't want to uh, you know, have algorithms that are able to take the, you know, drop the directionality on the edges and recover a cluster simply by looking at the edge density. And let's define this matrix F that controls the orientation of the edges between the clusters. Yeah, so uh, this matrix is, is such that uh, FLJ plus FJL uh, equals to one. And, uh, and this matrix F can be understood that the, as a JSON matrix of a weighted directed graph that we can think of a metagraph that describes the relationship between the clusters. So what, what, uh, what could be such, such an example? So let's consider the cyclic block model where we have three clusters uh, and uh, the flow is, uh, is along, along, the, is along a, uh, a cycle. So the meta matrix, uh, the way we, we read this meta matrix is that 25% of the edges between cluster one and cluster two uh, flow from, one, from cluster one to cluster two and 75% the other way around. And then within the, within the cluster, edges have random orientation. We don't really care about them, okay? So in this example here, as I said earlier, we're assuming P and Q are, are equal just so that we cannot cheat and uh, drop directionality and consider uh, uh, standard, uh, standard techniques. And this, this example, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's also a good one because in expectation, all the vertices in G have the same in and out degree. So again, you can't simply have a naive solution where you look at the in and out degree, you build two features for each node in our degree, and then you cluster based on that. Okay. Uh, and I should say that within the clusters, 
uh, the edges are chosen, uh, the directionality of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the edges is uniform. So there's no sort of cluster, there's no structure within the cluster. Okay. And um, in the algorithm, uh, as I said earlier, we build this adjacent, this Hermitian adjacency matrix. Uh, um, you can do this in the unweighted case, but it can also be extended easily to the directed setting. Uh, so we have this Hermitian matrix. We consider a normalized Hermitian Laplacian matrix. Uh, it's very similar to the ones we defined earlier for the sign case, and I'll, I'll, I'll say a bit more about this on the on the next slide. We look at the top eigenvalues, eigenvector pairs of this uh, normalized her 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 Hermitian matrix, and we apply k means to get the resulting embedding, and that that uh, will give our our clustering. And for the as I said earlier, for general directed graphs where the adjacent symmetric is not skew symmetric, then we we, we make it skew symmetric before building the Hermitian matrix. Um, and then the type of guarantees we can get here, for example, when the underlying metagraph is a cyclic block structure, then we can get an upper bound on the number of misclassified vertices. So again, using very similar techniques to those that we've, we've used earlier for the sign setting, uh, we can show that this matrix, Hermitian matrix A is close to its expectation and that using standard results from uh, uh, one plus epsilon approximation guarantees for k-means, we can also get an upper bound on the number of misclassified vertices by this uh, k-means algorithm. And um, just to say a little bit about um, why, just to give some intuition about why, why is this Hermitian matrix useful and, and why are the results looking um, so much better than the methods that we're comparing against. So previous spectral methods, they typically, typically count the number of common parents and common children, right? So if you look at M transpose M or MM transpose, you think a bit about this, and this essentially for a pair of nodes U and V, it counts a num the number of common parents and common children. So indeed, some of the existing methods, they have looked at similar symmetrization techniques for making the directed matrix symmetric and then proceeding with standard algorithms uh, for clustering such symmetric matrices. But in our case, if you recall this Hermitian matrix A, and then we consider uh, A squared because A and A squared share the same eigenvectors, essentially what the A squared is doing is not only counting common parents and common children, but it's also counting this common term here it's counting intermediaries. Uh, uh, it's, it's penalizing for intermediate, uh, intermediate points between U and V. So these are, you know, it's, it's, it's counting the number of nodes W such, such that U points to W or W uh, and W points to V or the other way around. So uh, this is also similar to, uh, for example, those of you who've seen work by Alex Dasperman, who, who, speak, I, who spoke, I think, a couple of weeks ago, but they've used similar uh, technique for ranking from pairwise comparison and they were building the similarity matrix uh, like the ones we're looking at here for ranking. And the intuition being that players who have similar ranking, they have beaten the same set of players and have, beat, have been beaten by the same set of players. So in other words, what this emission matrix does, it implicitly assigns also positive weights between a pair of vertices who have uh, more common parents and offsprings than this mismatch relations with third vertices, okay? And, uh, and the two uh, structures that we consider, so I mentioned be, before this uh, cyclic meta, uh, the cyclic structure. So this, this is a cycle on C4. It's a good example because an expectation nodes have the same uh, expected in and out degree. And the blue edges here, it just means that you're tossing edges, uh, you know, 50% to have uh, either direction. And then the green edges denote the noise in the problem, right? So if, if along the green edge, you, your, uh, your eta parameter is for something like 20%, then along the green edges, we have 80% of the mass flowing from node zero to node one in line with the direction on the green edge, and only 20% of the mass flowing the other way around. Right? We're looking at, uh, at this uh, cyclic metagraph structure, but you can also can have a complete metagraph structure, for example. So you have a, a, an edge in the metagraph between any pairs of clusters, and then you have noise coming into play to pollute these relationships, right? And uh, just like in the unsigned, unnormalized setting, we can also uh, consider normalization of this Hermitian matrix. So this A random walk matrix, which is D minus uh, D inverse A, where D is a diagonal matrix with the um, uh, sum of the absolute values in, 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 in each row or the Hermitian symmetrized versions. And the same types of, uh, of operators have also arisen in group synchronization, for, for example, in different communities call these matrices, uh, give them different names. So the physicians call them like magnetic Laplacians, but uh, this is essentially um, also for, for those of you who've, who've looked at synchronization, group synchronization before, it's this uh, connection Laplacian, 
which uh, when you do synchronization over Z2, you can, uh, you can simply write this as a uh, involving Hermitian matrices. So if you, if you look at this cyclic metagraph structure that we've looked at earlier, when you look at the spectrum, then indeed you see uh, the right number of eigenvalues popping outside of the semicircular law. Then we see something similar for whenever we have a complete metagraph structure that uh, you have eigenvalues and eigenvectors popping outside of the, of the bulk of the, of the eigenvalues. And then one, one technique we want to be compared against is again some work by B News Group uh, at Berkeley. They had a PNS paper in 2016 when they looked at clustering directed graphs. And I won't get into the details, but I'll just say that they also use the regularized Laplacian matrix. So A is the adjacency matrix, but they, they build these matrices O and P, which are, which are very similar to the regularization we've seen before that I've discussed, uh, where you shift by, uh, by, by a constant. But long story short, they build these regularized Laplacian matrices. They compute the top K left and right singular vectors of this regularized Laplacian matrix. They stack these matrices to, to each other, project the rows onto the sphere. Uh, this is a standard trick. Uh, it's, it's very useful for spectral clustering to do this spherical projection. Uh, and then they uh, simply concatenate these vectors and run standard K means. And uh, one of the advantages is that A uh, doesn't have to be skew-symmetric matrix. While in our approach, we really need, we need, the, we really need the, 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 the graph to be, the, the adjacent matrix to be skew-symmetric. Um, and they also have the similar types of weak recovery guarantees, uh, similar to those in our setting. And uh, so let's see in practice how this works. So let's consider those two patterns that we were looking at earlier, the circular pattern, the cyclic structure, and the complete metagraph structure. Uh, Hermitian and the Hermitian random walk are, uh, is the algorithm that I described earlier. This uh, DISG uh, left, right, and left, right is uh, what I mentioned in the previous slides, the, 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 the Berkeley people uh, looking at this co-clustering. And then this bisimilarity and DD, uh, bisim and DD sim, they are just uh, techniques from uh, uh, symmetrization. So I, I will, I've mentioned earlier that standard ways to, to tackle problems on directed graphs is to apply different symmetrization techniques to convert the matrices into symmetric matrices and then proceed with standard tools. So we're looking at here at the uh, adjusted RAND index. So the uh, recovery rate, uh, you know, the higher, the better. So the, the, cl the closer to one the value is, then the more, uh, the closer we have the clusters to be to the to, to ground truth. And then we, we model here, uh, we vary the noise level parameters. So remember the noise is this, no this the, the fraction of edges that go against the flow. Right. Remember, if you remember the green edges on those metagraph structures, if the noise is zero, then 100% of the edges go according to the, to, to the correct flow. Right. If noise is you know, 25%, then 75% go according to the flow, and 25% go the other way around. So already in this setting here, which uh, we're looking at a setting with five clusters, 5,000 nodes, and fairly high sparsity level, so half a percent, uh, results are average over, over 10 runs, we already see that this Hermitian random walk uh, techniques, they already dominate all the other methods as a function of, uh, of their recovery score. Uh, but even more, if we make the problem harder, well, harder here means one of two things. Either you make the graph sparser, because we know the spectral methods have a hard time uh, in, the, in the very sparse regime, or we increase the noise level. Uh, so he, here for, for very small sparsity, if we vary the noise level, again, the gap between our Hermitian techniques and the, the rest of the, of the world um, widens. Uh, and if we make the graph even sparser, like literally none of the other techniques are able to give any meaningful results. I mean, they, they get recovery scores under 10%, while this Hermitian-based techniques are able to get 60, 70% recovery, uh, uh, you know, uh, alignment with the ground tooth clusters. Okay, so if we look at this at uh, this uh, migration network that I've described earlier, uh, mainly for the, I want to say a bit about this just uh, so I uh, introduce this um, objective functions and to also highlight one of the shortcomings, sh sh you know, disadvantages of this method and where would we like to uh, to do better. Um, so, um, so the top techniques are, you know, clustering that you get using standard methods. The bottom ones are our Hermitian ones. Of course, the top methods, they have pretty good alignment with the, the, the states in the US, while our Hermitian ones do not have so, because that's not the point that we're, we're after. And let, let's look at a little bit of what do these clusters that we recover, what do they tell us in terms of this cut imbalance? So let's define for a pair of clusters X and Y, we define the cut imbalance ratio to be the ratio between the weights flowing from X to Y and the weights and the sum of the weights flowing from X to Y plus the weights from Y to X, okay? 
So ideally, we would like to promote this imbalance. We need this imbalance to be either closer to zero or close to one. Okay. And in other words, we aim to, to maximize this normalized uh, cut, in, uh, cut imbalance. So it's the absolute value between the cut imbalance minus 0 0.5. So we'd like to, to be a number, the, the, this number as large as possible. And now, if you remember on the, on the second slide, back to the formulation that Shin Malik had for the standard spectral clustering, they were penalizing for small clusters. Remember, you had the sum, summation over the cut divided by the volume of a cluster. So just to penalize and stay away for, from typically small clusters. So in our case, what could normalization look like? Well, we, we take this normalized cut imbalance and we want to penalize it by, let's say, the minimum of the cluster sizes X and Y, or by the minimum of the volumes of the two clusters X and Y, right? Because this quantity we aim to, 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 to maximize, right? So if either the size of the cluster or the volume of the cluster is small, then this is uh, not desirable, right? Where the volume is, again, is defined as the sum of the in and out degree. So ideally, we would like to maximize uh, we would like to propose an objective function that maximizes uh, the, the, this cluster imbalance, let's say this normalized cluster imbalance for the top M largest pairs in the graph. So we have K clusters here. So in practice, it may not be reasonable to assume that you, you observe a cut imbalance be between all K to two pairs of interactions, but at least some number M of L you would like to, uh, to, to have this high imbalance, okay? And that's where the disadvantage of, of, of our method comes in, is that it, it's not the result of a relaxation of a certain optimization problem, right? So that's, uh, we've been thinking about this for, 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 for a while, but it's not very clear uh, just because, you know, intrinsically, just by the way how you define the problem, the objective function has to do with pairs of clusters, interactions of clusters, while in the standard spectral clustering, right? You could, you could do relaxation because it's each cluster and the rest of the world, and that the summation of normalized cut you can normalize them and give them interpretation as cluster indicator vectors. Well, here, that's not, that's not quite the case. So there's been some follow-up work when the underlying metagraph is a path, but so there you know what the sequence of clusters is, but it's, it, it's not clear how to, to do this in the general setting. So indeed, if we go back and look at, and look at this graph cluster assignment uh, for this uh, migration matrix, so uh, what we observe are indeed, we get clusters that have either very high imbalance, so the green numbers here uh, are uh, this cut imbalance, so the farther from 0.5, the better, and the numbers in the purple here, they are the other flavors of normalized cut imbalance, where you also account for the size, you penalize by the minimum of the sizes of the cluster or by the volume of the cluster. So indeed, existing methods, they're not able to find good clusters with this uh, you know, cut imbalance in mind, while our techniques are able to find clusters that have very high imbalance. So, you know, 90% of the mass of the edge is flowing from uh, red to blue and 81% the other way around. But also when you penalize by the clusters, uh, this is still good. You can also actually see here that both the red and the green clusters are fairly large. And maybe I wanna use the remaining uh, five minutes or so just to talk about connections to synchronization and ranking from pairwise comparison uh, data. So uh, what's the typical scenario here is that uh, we have a vector R, which is an unknown signal. For example, it could denote the strength of a player. We have a, a measurement graph. And whenever we have an edge in the graph, we measure Ri minus Rj. So uh, either the, the, the correct measurement, if we don't have any noise, or we measure a noisy version of this Ri minus Rj. So for example, this result could, uh, could encode the outcome of a, of, of a match uh, that reflects the scale difference between the two players. And the goal here, we want to estimate the vector R of strength. And clearly you can only do this up to a possible shift, uh, global shift. And, uh, and it's very simple to solve this problem when you don't have any noise uh, in the data and assuming the graph G is connected because you can just simply consider a spanning tree and then you propagate and you, it's very easy to get a, a, a solution. So this is an example, what, what I wrote here of, of doing synchronization over the real line when, uh, so the, you know, the underlying group here is, is a real line. So I know some of you here have worked on, on group synchronization. So uh, in the in the SO2 setting, the problem here is to define and to recover n unknown angles in, in SO2, uh, given a small subset of pairwise measurements t i minus theta j uh, modular to pi. And the challenges here are on one hand, we have a lot of noise in, 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 in the data. And on the other hand, uh, we only measure a very, very small subset of the n choose two pairwise interactions. And the question here is how do we get a robust solution to this? And then uh, how do we deal with variation when there exists an underlying cluster structure. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about this. So um, one way how this relates to ranking is that 
uh, let's say we are in the, in the setting where we measure Cij, which is Ri minus Rj, the, the, the skill of the player, plus some noise. So uh, some years ago, I've done some work where um, um, I've tried to use this in group synchronization machinery for the problem of, of rank recovery. So uh, just because uh, at the time we did not know how to do synchronization over non-compact groups like the real line, the, the idea here was let's uh, compactify the real line by wrapping it over the upper half of the unit sphere, just like I'm doing here. So these are like players, uh, football teams. Imagine they live on the upper half of the unit circle. And then whenever you have a pairwise comparison between a pair of teams I and J, let's use this transformation to map uh, this uh, strength of the players as, uh, as angles, the, the, the pairwise match outcomes to map them to pairwise angle offsets, okay? And then once you do so, you're able to use uh, the standard group synchronization over SO2 to recover the, the, the solution to this problem uh, with the extra caveat that the solution that you get is up to a global shift. Right, so then you have to do an extra post-processing step to mod out the best circular per permutation. So, uh, and then you can read off the ranking. And uh, even to this date, uh, this algorithm, when compared to a good number of eight, nine methods from, from you know, state-of-the-art methods for, for ranking, it does still surprisingly well. And then uh, this synchronization, you can either uh, solve it either via the spectral or the SDP relaxation. So why am I mentioning this? Uh, I don't have much time to go into this, but there's some applications where, when you look in the when you look at the comparison matrix, it has an underlying cluster structure. So this can be motivated by the fact that in some applications, especially finance, there does not exist a single global ordering of the all n elements, but rather what there exists is the partition of the matrix into clusters, such that within each matrix, within each sub matrix, you can find an ordering of the players that as globally consistent as possible. So what this motivated us, what this would correspond in the cluster synchronization setting is that imagine that we have uh, two sets of players, alpha and beta, uh, but they could be angles in uh, zero to pi. And whenever a pair of red angles, a pair of alpha angles meet, you observe alpha i minus alpha j, like the red dots here, and x simply denotes uh, a missing entry, yeah? Whenever a pair of beta players meet, you measure beta i minus beta j. But whenever an alpha player and the beta player meet, then you measure a complete uh, random inf information. Yeah? And the goal is, given one single instance of this problem, can we recover the uh, set of angles, so the alpha and the beta angles? Okay? And uh, yet another variation that we've, uh, we've looked at very recently is that of bisynchronization, where instead of there being a single set of, of, of angles, now you have two sets of angles that sit on the same node of the graph. So let's say we have uh, um, alpha one to alpha n and beta one to beta n. And then every time you have a measurement in the graph, you either measure alpha I minus beta i or you measure beta j minus uh, beta k, right? But what you see the measurement graph is just a summation of the red and the blue graph plus noise, okay? So then the question is, given this instance of this problem, can we recover the two different sets of angles, okay? And the, mo the motivation for this problem, it could be, for example, in some of, some of these ranking applications, you really have uh, this alpha and beta angles. Imagine they could be juries, for example, and they, each jury uh, evaluates a certain type of match outcomes, right? And, uh, and there's some other application that I can, uh, can, uh, can discuss, but uh, uh, I just wanna say that these problems are, are well motivated by certain applications. And here, just like in the previous settings, we're all able to give recovery guarantees. Uh, assuming some orthogonality conditions between the alpha and beta angles, we're able to recover using, again, a spectral method, the alpha and the beta angles, and also give guarantees uh, on a you know, lower bound on the correlation with the ground truth. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll end with giving an, an, a high-level overview. So what we've discussed today, uh, mainly focused on spectral methods for sign clustering and directed clustering, and uh, sign clustering can be seen as an instance of the group synchronization over Z2. Uh, I've, I'm a bit rushed at the end. I've, I, I've tried to argue how these problems are connected to group synchronization over SO2 and over the real line, and uh, what are some potential connections to, to ranking, and what are some uh, synchronization problem where this type of rank, ranking structure arises in the form of bisynchronization or cluster synchronization. And, uh, and I should say that this is the, sort of the bigger picture that we've been working on for the last couple of years is that we've not looked at only spectral methods for this problem, but we've looked at different other techniques. So for example, 
Uh, you can use semi-definite programming for groups in combination and sign clustering. We've looked at the MBO techniques for sign clustering. So if you recall uh, one of the earlier talks in the seminar, I believe when the pandemic started was by Andrea Bertozzi, who was looking at certain types of uh, graph diffusion interforce model to do uh, for, for standard graph clustering. We, we have adapted some of that machinery for sign clustering. We've also looked at clustering using motifs uh, for directed clustering. And we've also uh, looked at using uh, this graph neural networks. I think there was a talk a couple of years ago by I think Michael Perimeter from UCLA on try to use graph neural network techniques for directed graph clustering. We've looked at uh, this uh, GNNs for both ranking and directed clustering and sign clustering. And uh, more in the long term, it'd be interesting, I think, to, to, to see if we can use graph neural networks techniques for, for group synchronization. Um, and some more future work are extension of various types of problems to the temporal uh, setting where you have time dependency. So you don't see, measure a single snapshot of your graph, whether your graph is in the context of time clustering or directed clustering or synchronization, but you measure, you have a, 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 you know, a sequence of, of, of graphs and also the setting where we have um, uh, covert information available. So in all of the settings, in many applications, you have uh, features available. So you know, what we call no level covariates. And uh, just in, in, in summary, I've hopefully I managed to convince you that spectral methods are computationally scalable. They're robust to high levels of noise in the data. And uh, we can also get guarantees under suitably defined uh, stochastic block models. And there's a number of extensions uh, that I could list here, but maybe in the interest of time, I'll, 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 I'll stop here. And then I'm happy to discuss some uh, very concrete extensions uh, if there are any, any questions.